yes yeah, so we just established UBI lab women to focus on you know like women's issues in the UK and how UBI could really help women in poverty here in the UK and Wales um, and then Leo if you wanted to introduce yourself sure yes yeah, so uh, my name's Leo um, just a graduated university in in Cardiff uh, in Wales uh, established UBI lab youth uh, on the basis that um, the UBI campaign, I think, is too sort of centred around the ideas of sort of automation and things like that. And we sort of lose sight of uh, the communities which UBI benefits the most. So that would be uh, Lydia's case for women, uh, the LGBT community, the BAME community and young people. Um, and that's why I was passionate about setting up UBI Youth. We're sort of part of the wider uh, UBI Lab network, which you might have seen uh, sort of popping up on social media in the UK. Uh, we were the first non-geographical based uh, lab which was set up. We basically uh, just sort of hammer, hammer home the arguments for uh, why UBI is important for young people. Um, just to give uh, a little bit of perspective as well, I'm a member of the uh, Labour Party in the UK, which is essentially the equivalent of the Democrats. But um, yeah, there's a little bit more of a discrepancy there. So yeah, uh, don't what's, worry, what's, uh, in, what's interesting is, is that, you know, our Labour Party's sort of logo is red uh, and a lot of Americans I've spoken to in the past have thought I was a Republican because lo our logo is red so uh, if that clears anything up then you know we're yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah no go ahead and ask any questions you like oh fantastic because I, I just wanted to let you know that we're v very familiar with how far right America's overton and politics are currently so don't you worry. <laughs> Honestly, maybe even 50 years ago, the Republican Party might have been analogous to today's Labour Party. Can I just say it's super cool that like we are getting people on for UBI in so many different countries. Well, okay, I say so many. We've had Canada and now you guys, but still like it's cool. It's like not just America and, and like if we can get more people from other countries, like just imagine it's a worldwide like mm -hmm. thing we could pull off, I think. If we if we're very careful. <laughs> could you imagine? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh yeah. A, a world based <laughs> income would completely change the fundamentals of capitalism around the globe. It wouldn't be wealth extraction and trade. It would actually be production maximum. It would be <laughs> incredible. And then and then you wouldn't have people in other countries that are children jumping on trash piles, picking up plastic. OK, like they could actually just feed themselves without having to like put themselves in harm's way. Like other countries need it just as much as like our country. <laughs> like, ah. I don't know if you guys seen what I'm talking about, but like some, I think it was Orlando Bloom went to a different country and was like, just looking at the different poverty. It's a beautiful, uh, I want to say TV show or, but yeah, it's a TV show. But the first episode was like, I think it's on Netflix. Anyway, it's really good, <laughs> really sad. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Lydia and Leo, how far has Andrew Yang's name made it throughout the world? Or um, uh, was there any talk about him running for president in the UK? Or Not especially sort of Andrew Yang. I think a lot of people are drawn to the concept of universal basic income because in the UK we've had uh, the NHS. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, it was its 72nd birthday uh, just a couple of days ago. And that's universal health care. So I think a lot of people are drawn to the idea of universal basic income because it's sort of um, it's very similar to the NHS in the sense that uh, it gives everyone a, a sense that they can't go under a certain poverty line. Um, so I think Andrew Yang's campaign, like he did very much did really well to sort of elevate it. But I think in the UK, sort of UBI is still very much in its infancy uh, in terms of how the public perceive it a lot of people don't really know what ubi means like if you say basic income it's more uh sort of people could sort of imagine what it is but i think in the uk we're sort of you know we're quite quite far behind in that regard i mean the ubi was in uh roughly in the labor party's manifesto in in 2019 but then we lost incredibly heavily to boris johnson so i think it's maybe sort of discredited in that regard but you know we're still sort of fighting fighting for it <laughs> so on to the headline uh news then with brexit i know that uh britain and the wales as well as scotland were not already part of the eurozone um but now that you are 
completely out of the European Union, how much more likely do you think it is to get a bigger <laughs> than that? Lizzie, do you want to go first on that one? I'm, uh... <laughs> the, uh, the end cut off, just at the end. How much more likely do you think uh, it is basic income will pass now that Britain is its own country instead of part of the European Union? That's a tricky one. Um, I mean, with a Tory Conservative government, the EU is more sort of liberal and left leaning. Uh, it's just tricky how Brexit would impact it because it would have to be a UK wide thing, even though we have devolved politics in the UK. So Scotland has powers, Wales has powers, and then Northern Ireland. Um, it would have to come from central government. We, we don't have enough powers to uh, implement it individually. Yeah, we saw that with the uh, Scot Scotland election this last cycle, I believe. They got like really bad representation in the uh, central government because of the first past the post voting, I believe. Yeah, yeah, essentially. So it's, it's tricky in the UK, like you might get a lot of votes, but not necessarily the seats. I think it's, it's likely if the government were to change and be maybe a Labour government or something, but with a a conservative government, although UBI is cross party, it tends to be the more centre and left parties that are understanding of universal basic income. But in saying that, stories in recent months because of COVID have given the biggest amounts of, of spending probably ever. Um, they've actually taken on policies that Labour would have backed in terms of like spending and paying job security and stuff. But well, sadly, after yeah. COVID, will probably be reversed um, and is being reversed and rolled back now but I, it makes it harder for them to say they haven't got the money when they clearly there there is there is pots of money available but in terms of Brexit I'm not sure I'm not sure if it, it gives us more power to do certain things or if it makes it harder because essentially we're in a, a we're run by a right-wing party at the minute. Yeah, well, I guess that's more on the uh, pandemic side because uh, the, the economy is so fragile right now that Keynesian stimulus is the only thing that saves it, even with uh, conservative fiscal ideals. Yeah, and I mean, the UBI would do better for the economy right now if you, and it's sort of what they, in the UK now, they're going to look at giving people like vouchers to go and spend money in like, shops and restaurants and, and clubs and all things like that coming out of lockdown so they're giving money to to people to spend you know for like domestic spending and stuff um, and disposable income the ideas of ubi are kind of there but not really supported by the tory government oh i i feel you our government's trying to push the exact same yeah. kind of garbage uh they are offering a four thousand dollar tax credit to vacation travels. So if you spend $8,000, you can take $4,000 off of your taxes because of your travel. But clearly yep. that's only a giveaway to the rich. Yeah, yeah, and essentially that, you know, we don't have enough money to help people pay their rent in the UK, but we have enough money to let people go and get drunk with their friends. So I think the priorities of the government are slightly yeah. questionable. Backwards. Well, if, if, if there is an economic back into UBI, that it would help the economy massively right now to reboot itself. Um, for people just to have a basic level of, um, of a safety net, really, in these troubling times that are just so hard for so many. But you know, what, what do you think, Leo, in terms of Brexit? Well, um, you know, I'm very passionate about in my room, I've got a huge EU flag <laughs> on the board. Hey, I, uh, I, I, I support the great work the EU has done. I just personally believe confederacies will never stand the test of time. But good good on the EU. Yeah, well, um, you know, fundamentally. I feel um, like from one confederacy to another, we're not doing um, so we're, well. we're a federacy. Don't, <laughs> oh, don't I'm sorry. the two. <laughs> sorry. We uh, went to war right, over of course, secession. Of course. The we're Brexit not won't see a that. federation yet, though. Yeah, but we're still a federacy. But yeah, no, so like fundamentally, uh, the, the UK is, is poor as a whole, being outside the European Union. The reasons for Brexit, which were peddled, are sort of this idea of, you know, being on our own, being British, being great, um, which is, you know, very much like a lot of people, I feel, are sort of stuck in this mindset that we've still just won the Second World War, um, which yeah. and we need to move on from that. Um, you yeah. know. That's not very dissimilar from the United States who 
still is acting like we won the Cold War yeah. and that <laughs> yeah. we beat communism and oh, America man. is the greatest thing ever. True. It's great. Uh, all that nonsense. That's so true. Right. Yeah. Uh, neoliberalism is a post-history worldview. That's the problem. It is indeed, yeah. as stated, World War II forever. And if you don't think that, you may never run for president. Yeah, so the EU uh, in itself is sort of economically neoliberal uh, with its sort of like... Uh, they've got a Schengen agreement where basically there's no borders for trading, things like that. Uh, but sort of uh, socially, it's very progressive, very liberal. Um, when in the UK, you know, sort of, there was a bit of a left wing argument uh, for leaving the EU, which, you know, we could sort of recover socialism after leaving it. But fundamentally, you know, the Tories are in power and they're like, you know, uh, probably about the same as Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan in terms of deregulation. Um, so it's just worse for our economy. And I think, you know, we are in the 21st century we need we need to be open that's fundamentally what globalization is globalization is a good thing especially with sort of students going in and around the world and everything so i mean i think uh, brexit is just damaging um and i just don't get this idea of you know britain being alone and sovereign in this world it's it's not it's it's not tenable so yeah i was unfortunately too young to vote in um the referendum in 2016 but if there was a second one I would be voting to uh, either rejoin the EU or remain in the EU, whatever the question is. But So I would like to ask a question to you guys. Um, what kind of efforts are you guys pulling off in your country that maybe you think America isn't capitalizing on yet, if anything at all? And or what are some of your guys' strategies and how efficient do you think they are? So in terms of UBI and like awareness, yeah. so mainly a, a basically come into UBI in lockdown like it's something we've got involved in in lockdown itself so at the minute everything we can do is digitally is just zoom and apart from you know doing events online and tweeting I think from my perspective of UBI lab women someone said and I hope no one takes offense that UBI is full of guys that love robots and love talking about automation but no one talks about women no one really talk you know there's those discussions aren't really had and so if you want to get ubi to as many people as you can you need to talk about the issues that affect them you need to talk about why ubi would be great for paying people you need to talk about why ubi could help people from the lgbt community and how it fundamentally could help women so until you have those conversations those groups of people aren't gonna join in really because they might not feel that it really applies to them and they like so with UBI Lab, youth and women, we're trying to showcase that young people, this can help you and women, this could help you as well. And just explain like the ways in which. So we've got a launch event for hey. UBI women. We'll just be sort of discussing issues from like domestic violence, unpaid, unpaid care work in the home, uh, the potential for adult learning and retraining. So I think for us, we just want to take the conversation to places it hasn't commonly been and really explore some sometimes more powerful arguments. I think, you know, the argument for financial agency and independency of women on the welfare system in the UK is something that's a really strong argument because in Brit in Britain and in Wales, we have universal credit, which if you need um, benefits, you apply to it. But if you live with a partner, the benefit is just given to you as a household um, and then because of this uh, the abuser in the relationship can hold and restrict um, finance and money from the abused often woman and if uh, one of the reasons women can't leave these relationships is because they're in poverty and they can't you know survive outside of the relationship so they're dependent on often the man's wage so if we had a universal basic income these women would would have an opportunity to leave or would be more likely to leave you know, it wouldn't solve domestic violence. We're not saying that. It's still a huge issue in society, but it would give a lot of women on the breadline the, the option to possibly leave. And so, you know, that's that's a hugely compelling reason that you should support UBI. Um, but one that isn't like one that often when I talk about a lot of people and often guys are like, oh, I, I never thought UBI could do that. I never made that connection. So apart from digitally like celebrating UBI in those ways we're gonna sort of do um like street stalls we had some ideas to in in Wales and obviously like the rest of the UK you've got like and the world you've got like a major city but then you often have sort of 
small towns where people don't feel represented and so for us it's really important like to do events in Cardiff which is a capital city but also then like the valleys where I'm from is a typically working class area and to go there and do street stores and just say like do you know what UBI is would you support it and just have a discussion really like in communities where we want to help people not just in these echo chambers of people that think the same and are all like uni graduates we want to talk to like real people so that was one of our ways forward i don't know if you want to add anything leo yeah no absolutely no so it's sort of like picking up on arguments which again hasn't really been uh, picked up before sort of by the ang campaign not through any fault of its own um but it's about sort of breaching that uh, twitter sphere going into you know actual mainstream politics and you know i think twitter is a really fantastic way of you know promoting things getting support for campaigns and stuff but a lot of people aren't on it and you know if an election was decided by twitter you know you wouldn't have trump in the us you wouldn't have boris in the uk but fundamentally like people feel that uh, there is a sort of like intelligentsia which exists on twitter so it's just about getting into um you know communities which need it the most communities which might not necessarily know about ubi um and again just like getting out there speaking to people so and also from sort of like the youth perspective as well uh we're sort of going down this route that ubi isn't sort of the be all and end all it's sort of it creates a foundation from which we can then build uh a sort of a more equal and go towards an equal society certainly sort of uh with with young people like what i was shocked that was like uh that ubi campaign like forcing up ubi lab youth hadn't even sort of thought about that you know, young uh, workers especially face wage discrimination going into jobs. Uh, like, for example, in the UK, uh, you could be working in the retail sector at the age of 16, getting four pounds something an hour. And you could get high, hired at the age of 18 for like two pounds more an hour, but for the same work. So just highlighting issues like that and seeing how this wage discrimination is having an impact on, on people uh, and saying how a UBI will help sort of push that in the right direction and stop that wage discrimination because you know alongside a UBI it can build the said build the foundations for equality uh, so we can sort of have the real living wage being implemented and then also end zero hours contracts and things like that and also um you know during, I don't know what it's been like in the US but in the UK um over I think it's like 620,000 jobs have been lost during lockdown uh, and most of those have been young people on the zero hours contracts in precarious employment and sort of showing how a UBI if it's implemented like in the next few years, it will be a bit more expensive than the current financial system. But it's about this idea of opportunity. It's about this idea of well-being. And, you know, if we build back, it's about building it's building back from COVID in terms of not just thinking about the economy, but thinking about the well-being of individuals and how a UBI uh, will help that. Because fundamentally, a lot of um, sort of mental health issues, financial stress comes about because of you know lack of finances. So uh, a UBI having a certain income every every uh, week, month, whatever, however it gets implemented, will sort of help us build back. Right. Yeah. I'm right about that, that with you, Leo. I think that the main issue here is really, if you boil it all down, it's like freedom and agency. Because when, when we talk about like, you know, uh, women and children, basically like, you know, the man, someone over his 30s or they're 35 and older, let's just say, is if they're like the main breadwinner, then you are at the mercy of their whims because it's like without them, where are you going to get your, you know, finances? But even the breadwinner is at the mercy of whatever work or job that they work for. Because let's say that the boss is having a bad day and then the boss takes that pressure out on the worker and that worker is a head of a household and he takes that pressure out on his wife and kids. And, and, and even, even in the corporation, like, like it, it's always like there's a main manager that puts a lot of pressure on the other, you know, managers. And then there's pressure on the salesman to like sell things or the retail workers to like sell to the customers. And then there's all this pressure coming from the top to the bottom because it's it's all linked to this money chain this this like hold but when you give a ubi so much of that pressure goes away 
And no one can threaten anyone saying, if you don't do this or if you don't do that, I'm going to cut off this from you or I'm going to pay you less. And like, it, it's so much off of so many people at the same time. Yeah, I feel that personally as well. As someone who has been uh, working on the LGBTQIA plus side of things, trying to help people avoid homelessness in that situation, not just because of the pandemic, which has completely annihilated a lot of the people that I know's jobs, except for those who work in tech and can work from home. It's just there's so much need for a universal basic income for these individuals in order to have the financial freedom to where if they come out to their family when they're in high school or college, like a lot of these people in any state, I mean, it doesn't matter how blue your state is, if you have relatives that are not helpful for you being yourself, they can kick you out of your house with like no warning and Mm -hmm. like write you out of your family and give you no support. So having a universal basic income that includes people, you know, over the age of 13 or 14, where they have control of their own money, uh, that would definitely help alleviate the amount of work that I personally have to do, try and do that. And I mean, it won't completely eliminate the problem, but it'll help. I think what happens, though, is you you are given autonomy. You get to be your own individual being and you get to navigate the world to find your tribe. So if you don't belong to the tribe you came from, you have the ability to find one that you're accepted in. Right. And it gives you that like foundation to walk on while you look around. You know, I, I think like we grew up in areas where nobody is like exactly on board with uh who we are how we are right but certain cities you know maybe are a little more accepting like portland oregon super accepting of anyone uh lgbtq etc you know uh and and so uh like that's where it's safe to like come out and be yourself and just walk around not look over your shoulder you know but if you go to the south not the same right so it gives you even travel money to go find your people uh, in my opinion. Oh. So I think it's beyond good to have travel people to find your uh, proper community. This is exactly what uh, business wants as well. And big business, especially. And even if they don't realize it, this is what's going to really help them. Relocating to a community where you can produce more and find more happiness is incredibly valuable to the macro economy especially international giants that rely on thousands of people being properly trained and properly placed. I know that's been a problem with a lot of members in my family. Uh, I come from a not even lower middle class, uh, you know, upper lower class at best. Um, A bunch of blue collar factory workers, retail workers. And my mom went to college multiple times on loans and grants and has multiple different degrees and certifications, but because she does not have the money to move to a larger area, that means that she is unable to utilize that because of the lack of employment opportunities in my hometown of like 13,000. Because half of them are in nursing homes. And if you don't want to wipe an old person's butt, there ain't no jobs for you. Well, and and think about like uh, Flint, Michigan, I think it was, right? Uh, Where the water is bad, right? And people have spent money on their mortgages and they were essentially uh, stuck there, right? And they're like, well, why don't you just sell your house? And you're like, well, do you want to buy my house? (laughs) Okay, that was their problem, right? (laughs) Like, like, okay, like, go for it. Please uh, buy me out of my mo- They couldn't, right? Because the water is so bad, though. Like, it was poisoning people. Thing where we, we don't realize how stuck we are unless we have a little bit of escape money, if you will, you know? <laughs> and at the point, you, ra- you ra- raised, like, you know, the economic benefits of a UBI. But um, a lot of the issues in the UK, probably the same as America, like, kind of, well, the fear mongering of right-wing parties is like immigration and the benefit system 
and how benefit systems are like used by scroungers, which is totally untrue and it demonizes working class vulnerable people that so badly could do with the UBI. But there's a big problem in the UK of um, sort of like a feeling of shame of using the benefit system. If you use the benefit system in the UK, like a lot of people say you're scrounging off the state. And so what a UBI would do is effectively, there are no scroungers, if you believe that there ever were, because everyone is one, because no matter you're a Premier League football player or you're unemployed, everyone gets the set amount of money. And so it actually takes away a huge burden and shame of using a basic, you know, benefit system, which anyone from, we've seen in COVID, people that had great businesses that they run themselves suddenly found themselves using the benefit system. So this whole myth that is just poor people that need benefits was finally kind of, you know, shattered in COVID. And you had people that were normally quite middle class signing up to the universal credit scheme or trying to get some benefits and so a UBI would really just help people that need help from the government to not no longer feel ashamed and no longer feel like they're you know sponging off the system but then another point in the UK that constantly comes up is a fear of like immigration and it's it's very racist in its connotations but essentially a lot of people that claim asylum asylum in the UK actually can't work um there's a long period of time that asylum seekers are denied the right to work in the UK which is bonkers because, you know, if you wanted actually people that come to the UK to work and to help our country like they so often do, then give them a UBI then, because at least then they'd have an income so that they could spend. And it's not about just giving people enough to live on. It's giving people enough to live on and more. So you don't just get benefits and you get food and pay your bills. You get a benefit. Thank you. You have enough to pay your bills, you have enough to go and take your children out to the cinema, you have enough to go buy clothes so that you can actually invest in the economy. Because the bit the, the way the benefit system is at the minute, you've just got enough to get by, often not even enough to get by in reality in the UK. Uh, most people on benefits are actually in work in the UK and like the statistics are quite shocking. So if we had a benefit system that gave people enough to have a good life, to actually invest in domestic spending and, and so on, it would really help the economy more because at the minute we just gave enough people enough to keep struggling basically but not actually leave and lift them out of poverty this is my critique of the minimum basic income like andrew yang was piloting great great plan but it was still only the bare minimum it was actually just below the poverty line and in many places especially high cost coastal areas or high cost uh tech areas or manufacturing yeah. areas the uh, costs of living far outstrip that benefit and there's no disposable income going back to fuel the recirculation that our economy thrives off of the only yeah. way we actually move is because of how numerous we trade with each other and that trade is interrupted when people can't e- effectively trade when when they say that uh this uh welfare is expensive or something like that that's not true Because when you say something is expensive, it's like you're using something up, but you don't use up the money. The money passes from one person to another. So if you give the money to, um, for example, the food stamps recipients in our country, uh, you're giving resources to them, right? You're issuing money to them, but only for food. So, but the people don't keep that money. The money doesn't stay in their account. They have to buy food with it. So it's not that you're helping them specifically, right? You're helping entire giant groups of the economy. So the entire food industry is grabbing for that money, right? I mean, so it doesn't benefit small farmers. It doesn't benefit certain types of uh, food producers. It doesn't benefit like the small ethnic markets in my town because they don't have the ability to receive SNAP. And for some reason, it's like too difficult for them to go and, uh, you know, get that done. But it does benefit these giant corporations like Safeway or, you know, like, uh, Walmart or Kroger's, they have the ability to accept SNAP and they're the ones that benefit. So it's not just the welfare recipients that benefit. It gets used uh, throughout the chain and everybody who's participating in that industry is benefiting. Um, And so the same thing I would say right now that what we're doing is just constantly corporate aid, right? When we say, oh, we're giving this food money to welfare recipients. No, you're giving the money to these giant corporations because you're biasing who gets that money. 
there are a lot of people who can't afford food unless they use their food stamps. And I can't use my food stamps at the farmer's market. I can't use my food stamps at you know, uh, this little tiny ethnic market. So we're actually biasing how the money is distributed in our economy. And that's what we're really looking at is fairness. So in my, yeah, go well, ahead. Oh. You're going to summarize it sound like maybe. Oh, well, I, I'm also going towards my other comment, which is that nobody's freedom should depend on just one other person, which is what women are always in the situation of. When mm -hmm. we're born, we're born into a household where the parents have control over you. And then at some point when you grow up, yeah, you can go out and make it in the world. But if you start having children again, once again, you're dependent on another person yeah. helping you because you can't work the same way that other adults can work. If you are a woman, you're constantly dependent on one other person or maybe two other people or a very small group of people who provide you with the freedom in order to do whatever you want to do. And if that person that you're depending on is less capable or if that person is um, uh, disagrees with you philosophically about something or you know, wants to control you in some way, then you just have to accept it. That could be true for, for other people who are not in the case of a caregiver, um, if you're working for a company, then your entire livelihood and freedom depends on that boss, you know, and that maybe the boss is a terrible boss and you're constantly under that, that problem. So the real issue here is that freedom has to be guaranteed by the state. And if the state doesn't guarantee your freedom, unless you do what your mom says, or unless you do what your husband says, then that's not real freedom. It's freedom with, yeah. Uh, contingencies, which is basically only a step or two above slavery. It's ridiculous. Um, yeah. And as far as the needing a small group of people, um, if you're a woman, my father and my mother could not cohabitate or agree enough to do more than make me. So for most of my childhood, my mother struggled to be a single parent to me and my two siblings. My grandmother worked two full-time factory jobs to try and help out and i had a lot of medical expenses because of birth defects and stuff thankfully i lived in a state that had uh medical assistance aka you know free health care for those who were as close to the poverty line as possible and when i was 15 i didn't have a choice i had to start working along going to school i had to start helping pay for the household bills because my mother was dating an alcoholic who spent all of our money on booze and things to you know feed that addiction of his and so from the age of 15 i didn't even know if i was going to be able to go to college outside of the year or two that i could get for free through pseo post-secondary occupational education program in my high school where if your grades are high enough, you can take all your classes at the college and get college credit as well as your high school credit. So I did that. But, you know, I had to work my butt off for the three years that I had a driver's license that I had to finish high school, to live with my family, to help cover for this other man that didn't do their part. And pretty much ever since then, you know, I've realized that, you know, it doesn't even matter if, you know, it's a single parent household, be it a mother or a father or a two person household, a universal basic income uplifts everybody and it allows everybody to spend their money in a way that hasn't been done before. And the excuses that our governments are using are the same excuses as to why they keep giving stuff like SNAP and corporate bailouts and all of that it's because if you are a rich white person or own a very large business you're allowed to get all the socialism that the government can offer you but if you're not one of them no because reaganomics says that the job creators quote unquote are the rich people but we have seen that money given to the top doesn't get recirculated, which is why people don't think that if we get a universal basic income, that the money will be circulated through the economy and actually boost the economy because the status quo has been giving the money to the wrong people who don't spend it. 
and thus they oh. think any money that go that gets take gets given out as a stimulus just goes to them and stays there and doesn't go back into the economy. Just Don, uh, I, I you need to check out Economic Explains most recent video. They talk about billionaires and their savings glut and how it's actually causing a problem in our financial markets because there's nowhere for their immense wealth to go. I've actually seen that already. Yeah. Because <laughs> I think you posted a link to it. Well, I, I wanted to touch on a couple topics. We've kind of blasted through a couple. So uh, since I last wanted to talk, uh, we were talking about the UBI, or not UBI, uh, food stamps. So I'm a recipient of food stamps too. Uh, I, I get about $200 a month, right? And as I was helping on the Yang campaign across, uh, like, I mean, I met some of these people in Iowa. But anyway, like, I was like, oh, we can get whatever you want. I got food stamps. They're like, what's that? And then, like, they saw me purchase food. They look at me. They're like, it's a, like, credit card for food. You know, they were, like, so excited. Like, oh, my God, you could just give food and feed yourself, right? And this person's a too thick, okay? Like, this was, like, new information for them or a debit card or whatever they called it. But they were just like, you could just get food from this? Yes. And I'm like, yeah, you can sign up. Like, you know, it'll help you. I've actually had to tell friends of mine in college and uh, who have gone out on their own and work like barely enough to pay their bills. Like I've had to tell my friends about welfare programs because guess who was on them for most of my childhood? I know the system. I know that these things exist to help you out. And you know, if some of these people didn't get them, they probably would have had their, you know, newborn kids taken away or, you know, just had to skip meals or, you know, move into a crappier place. There's just that, so much stuff that people don't know about because of the fact that our our welfare social safety net is so pressed upon politically as the devil that we don't even educate people that they exist. Beyond that, uh, we have so many disparate welfare programs that cover so many different minutia that you probably are covered, but not by the program that you thought you were covered by. So there's no real collection of all these programs and a basic income is just so much simpler. Yeah, and it's so much simpler because all those programs take applications and applications take time. And then not only after you apply, you have to wait for your caseworker to look over the information and then determine whether or not you signed up for the right thing. And hopefully they're good enough to point you in the right direction to the things that you need. Or instead of just saying, oh, no, you don't qualify for this one. Um, Faye, yeah, did you uh, get a chance to, um, to give your full comment? <laughs> no, it's OK. Um, but it, well, with the whole food stamps thing, though, like you, you're right, like people don't know it exists and, and there's a shame to it, but it, it doesn't actually not everyone before uh, I think before Corona, BC, uh, like uh, people, uh, you know, would apply. And I at one point, I think I get, was like gifted like it was under 20 bucks for, per month for food. I was like, well, that's a slap in the face. And like at that point in time, I was starving myself. I had lost a lot of weight. I could barely afford rent, right? You know, and, and, and so it's it's stuff like this that lead to people making bad decisions too, right? They are like, well, I am dying. My food in my belly is not enough. And that's when I qualified for like less than $20. And uh, it, like, it was like, okay, well, we either have to move or, uh, you know, or I, I feel like I'm going to die, <laughs> you know, and it took, uh, like one or two more months before we could finally move. But like, then we moved into the crazy cat lady's house. Okay. And it was when, because it was so cheap, you know, we were able to afford it, but the mental terror, like that we had, okay. So I make it sound dramatic, but like, I mean, this woman was like my, it was, uh, a couple right and like this woman was on her boyfriend punching him in the face at one point it threatened to slit my partner's throat and when the internet got turned off because I couldn't afford it they stabbed my tire okay so like because we have to settle <laughs> for cheaper uh, we actually put ourselves in more traumatic situations even so 
it's really important to make sure you're fed so you don't have to move so that you don't have to live with people that you're not compatible with. Say you're making it sound dramatic, but actually that that type of violence is not uh, is really not OK. And it's it's no. very extreme. Yeah, yeah but it, it's traumatizing. Imagine if a child was in there watching this. Right? And it's like a, it becomes a normal for some people because they live with it all the time. They just have to deal with it. You know, and then, and then I found out later from the local uh, store guy, he was like, oh, yeah, most people who move out of that place end up using or like involving the cops. Like you couldn't have warned me before I moved in with them, you know. But yeah, it's, it's, it's like you settle and we should not be settled. We should be raising the bar, if anything. Right. It yeah. doesn't matter what country you are. We should be able to raise the bar of what's acceptable. 100%. That, that's why it's like I love this, like coming together, whether it's like the UK, Canada. Hey, let's get South Africa involved. Let's get Australia. It doesn't matter because it's like uh, we, we have all the evidence. That, that that that's why that like Lydia and Leo have a lab. So if we go to our elected officials with all the evidence, how can they argue with that? It it it's like it's like it it doesn't make people lazy. It doesn't make people less willing to work. In fact, when I got these extended unemployment benefits and uh, I I felt that like rush of liquidity. I felt really active, actually. I felt when I had more money, I wanted to do more things. I wanted to get more involved. I wanted to like work on things more, but they never talk about that. And we just have to get our uh, things out there. I mean, uh, Lydia and Leo, how, how um, active have you been in like bringing all the evidence to like your officials and things like that? And what did they have to say about it? Or do they just try to ignore you? Oh no, we've been, um very active so other than the ubi lab youth i'm also involved in ubi lab uh, cardiff and we've had um sort of consistent um interactions with uh, members of parliament uh councillors and also uh, in wales because we've got uh, devolved uh, parliament members of what's well, called the senate members of the senate uh, and basically our campaign is being about as, to get as many of them on board as possible i think in, in the us like it's very different because like sort of a congressman or a member of the senate is very much um you know quite quite a distance away in terms of like the rungs you've got to go through when very much in the uk like if you know the right people or get getting the right contacts uh, or just know sort of where to go you can get in touch with an elected official very very easily um and sort of just have a sort of few further comments really on um I think it's sort of like the whole conversation shows the difference between the universal basic and conversation in the US compared to the UK because uh, you know you sort of talk about uh, sort of freedom and, and liberty and how uh, UBI gives um, you those things in that regard which is like very much in the US context but in the UK I think we're sort of focusing more around sort of equality and opportunity um, because you know it's a UBI is something again which is cross-party but socialist in principles and I think it's not about being afraid to say that we are you know this is a socialist policy it's just about getting as many people on board as we can as I say um, and I think that's how we can get as many elected officials on board because you sort of portray it as uh, not only um, something which helps sort of the standard sort of white collar uh, sorry not white collar, blue collar family but also again as many um different areas as possible sort of lgbtqia plus women uh being communities and everything and sort of uh, again coming down this idea of uh mental well-being i think is the key key part to this you know with, with covid what we've seen is you know suicide rates going through the roof especially in the, i don't know what they are in the us but um you know we've put physical health so much above mental health at the moment we need to build back with this idea of mental well-being and giving people that financial stability really does help improve mental well-being. Um, and fundamentally, in, in the UK, we've got universal credit. Applying for universal credit for many people is just simply degrading because you get means tested. Um, and, you know, it's not not a good procedure at all. When, as, as Lydia was saying earlier, earlier on, a UBI is just so simple. Everyone gets the same thing. And it's sort of... Um, the idea of also quality of outcome that we, you know you will not go below a certain poverty line because the UBI is the line, it's the foundation. Um, and yeah, to sort of the whole idea of message of uh, opportunity is, I think, how we're getting our 
elected reps on board. I know, Lydia, you've had a lot of uh, interaction with especially sort of female MPs and MSs. Yeah, so we're holding a, a launch event um, on the 29th of July for UVA Lab Women. We've got a um, so Scottish MP from the SNP involved and we've reached out to quite a few different parties and different um, female politicians to really just try and show that, you know, is a cross party thing that we're pushing for and we, by appealing to different parties we get the message across and then in terms of research it's something that we're really aware of because we don't want to just be you know what we say is true like the, there are blatant positives to this but a lot of people will say well, where are the facts where's the evidence where's the statistics so you know there's there's only been a few trials but the trials have shown exactly what we've been saying so we tend to you know look at those but for our launch event, we're going to write a paper and it'll be an academically referenced paper that we'll look at, you know, research that's gone before. And then, I mean, long term, it'd be great to do our own research. But I know Cardiff, we're hoping to get a pilot scheme. So it just sort of having the pilot schemes will be a good way of gathering our own Welsh research and British research in, in our own countries. But aside from that, I think the argument that when you give people like more free time or more money that they become lazy has almost been proven wrong with COVID because obviously a lot of people have been pushed to the poverty line and haven't had like an income or freedom to do things. For some people in the UK, like myself, I've been furloughed. And so I've had a lot of free time and I've still had my income come in. Um, and so in that time, like I've got massively involved in UBI. I've been on Zoom calls mm -hmm. with politicians, with friends, talking about really important things. I've organised as a political activist with people in America, with people like, you know, everywhere. Um, so everyone seems to have been, has, has done something for themselves if they've had, if they've been in the right frame of mind and they've had an income, they've used their free time positively, whether it's like painting, going on more walks. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I really think that like all countries, you know, across the world can collaborate on this. We can use a uh, logic, evidence, science labs to like go and do something in our own media with our elected officials. And I'm going to say my Twitter handle like we usually do. You guys can find me at at. Ariel's Armada, so that's at A R I E L S underscore A R M A D A. And you can also find me on YouTube as a revolutionary uh, thinking. So, uh, Leo and Lydia, if you want to have this uh, conversation too, and out, out there, we can also do it on my YouTube channel. But other than that, I think that we're all in agreement uh, about like all of our basic things that we think about that a UBI will help with. And we just we just got to go after the ones who are skeptical and kind of show them the evidence. It'd be Thank nice you so much for them... introducing us, Ariel. Thank uh, you for introducing us to our new guest my, today. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Ariel. We'll see you later. Thank you. See you later. Yeah, thanks for coming. Bye, Ariel. Hi. I would like to hear, like he cut you off, Lydia, just a tiny bit, but I, I understand why. I would love to hear a little more about what you were saying, though, if you want to continue. So um, just sort of in the way that obviously in the US lockdown has been done differently in the UK and in um, Wales, it's gone on for a long time. And we've had the a lot of people that a lot of people haven't had um, access to furlough. So I don't want to talk on behalf of the people that have struggled, but some people like myself, I've been furloughed. And so I've, I've coped well in um, lockdown. And with the free time that I've had, you know, I've been able to like learn a new skill. And so the, the argument is often if people have like, if you give people money, um, if you give people more time, like they'll just be lazy or they won't be productive. But sort of just by looking at uh, some examples of like lockdown, a lot of people have like just spent more time with family, a lot of people in the recent Black Lives Matter protests across the UK, like a lot of people have never been to a protest before, had the time to research online why the Black Lives Matter protests were important and went. Like a lot of my friends that have never been to protests were going. So I think it gives people the time to be like politically engaged, to educate themselves, to even just like calm down and read a book. Like it gives people time to do whatever they want. And I think that's the important thing. It's, it doesn't give 
people the luxury to do nothing it gives them the luxury to do anything and so it just it's really important to stress that and to debunk this argument that people are just inherently lazy and they're just going to you know, use the money for no good because i think a lot of the actions of people in in um, this pandemic have been caring and people have come together and really helped one another so i think it shows where you have a bit more than someone else you'll often share it and and do good Lydia, things. Lydia, who, uh, when you say, uh, you know, people might use this money for no good, you're you're describing the current per paradigm, but who defines what's good for humans to do? Right now, I think the idea that there are some things that are good and some things that are bad doesn't really make a lot of sense. I mean, the only thing I can think of that's really bad is if you're hindering somebody else from doing what they want. So I find it I find it interesting. I mean, I think I think if the human decides that what they want to do is laze around on the beach all day, <laughs> right? If if they're able to somehow manage to do that, then we should be happy for them. We should applaud that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think I, I've ever been to a beach. <laughs> well, there you I go. Think, Maybe you should make it a bucket list item. <laughs> in the UK, we are you know more to the left, so. Some of the ideas in the UK will just fly a bit easier. People are, with, because we've got like the NHS, um, I think people are more understanding like universal services. So there is, we have sort of got an easier, easier sort of um, conversation to be had then. But again, there is still that argument of like, oh no, no, you have to work to earn a wage. But this is going on to another argument in the UK where we want to try and get like a four day working week and some parties are opposed to that and some parties aren't. But I think after COVID, like you'll see people working from home more. And like you said, more of a relaxation on what is good and what is bad. And I think it is good for people to do a bit less sometimes and it makes people more productive when they are working that's probably nothing to do with UBI really <laughs> bit of a weak link there. I mean there's been Beyond. studies about that for decades about how giving people vacation time giving people you know paid family leave time is a good thing but in the United States anything that isn't working yourself to death literally to death is seen as a horrible thing because the only way that our ruling class which includes many of both parties because that's how far right our country has gone in the last 30 years in order to keep you know the, the people from voting them out of part power from being you know educated enough and intellectual enough to know that they're being lied to and cheated that you know the only way is to make it as hard as possible for people to be humans, to live as humans, to, you know, have time to look up what their representatives are actually doing. And they're seeing so much right now with the coronavirus, with protests and people actually calling and emailing and writing letters to them all the time that it's just, we're, we're finally peeling back the veil of how we've been indoctrinated into thinking that work is good work is the only thing that we're supposed to do it doesn't matter if you work and your job doesn't allow you to go vote it doesn't matter if your job doesn't allow you to you know spend time with your sick kids it doesn't matter if your job doesn't allow you to take care of your mother when she's dying of cancer like that's what we've been trained for the last 30 to 40 years and to finally start seeing that, you know, okay, we, we're still surviving and most of us aren't working right now, living off of, you know, unemployment or uh, what little stimulus we got and, you know, gig work and the charity of others. Like people are realizing that no matter what the statistics are that we can bring to our representatives in the United States, our representatives aren't gonna listen. So the only option is to vote them out. So is yeah. does the welfare system work the same in the UK as in the US? No, it's uh, very, very different. So in the US, like what I was really shocked about, because uh, I've met a sort of a few few people from the US before, and I was just shocked that you guys didn't have like free healthcare. Um, so like, for example, we've had uh, free healthcare 
uh, since 1948 in the UK. And, I think and every time just... that we've tried to get it, like you guys, they uh, bring up the lovely thought about, oh, then the lines will be so long and you'll never be able to get in to see a doctor. But we mm. need more people. Like, have you ever actually had to wait in line for seven hours to go see a doctor? No. no we no, need no. have real elections. We can't have health care until we have real elections here. You know, that's. Mm. I mean, who knows? Maybe we can, but we also don't have real elections. Anyway, that's a big tangent. Please continue. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, glad yeah. to hear from you, Shell. <laughs> I mean, if we have the problem with our healthcare system being in the hands of the private corporations is that you depend on your boss already for your living, and now you have to depend on them for healthcare as well. And they can even make a trade off. We'll only pay for your healthcare if you accept less pay. And it's, it's just, it's unbelievable. Do you want more pay or do you that, want health care? Not only that, they can also restrict specific health care from women because of religious grounds. And they or just, just the fact that you might get pregnant. Like if I, if I go and try to buy private health care in the United States, it's $300 more per month for a woman who says, simply checks the box that, yes, I might get pregnant this year. If you just say that. You, it will be three hundred dollars more per month. And for that's you. why you lie. Insurance, and, <laughs> and that's that why you, incredible. That is mental. That, yeah, you, know, that's you might that. need a C-section. That's twenty thousand dollars in the United States at any major right. hospital. Yeah, this is like, and a, a, a lot of people see the UK as being quite a conservative with a small C country, um, and like it's surprised that we have uh, universal health care. Um, and I think that's just the argument. Sort of like sort of need to say, and like we've had it since 1948 with no real hiccups. So again, like the NHS has come something of a, a real sort of source of national pride, I think, um, mm. especially during COVID. Um, so I mean, the Olympics, right? in Taiwan as well. We are if, if we're very divided on the issue of whether or not to return to China peaceably, right, or whether to stay independent. So there's great division and racism in, in Taiwan uh, politics because we also have immigrants coming. But everybody is proud of our healthcare system. Mm. Absolutely <laughs> everybody, you know. Mm. So yeah, no, we were so proud until about a couple of weeks ago. We would uh, go out and clap on our doorsteps every, every Thursday at 8 p.m. Uh, for our health is called hashtag clap for carers and I think you know the NHS brings together sort of everyone from from the left to center to center right you know there are some people who want to get rid of the NHS uh, in the UK but you know that's a vast vast minority of people um, so and also I think a big part of UBI and how it links in uh, sort of universal health care is that we need to fundamentally change the way uh, we view tax because I think the UK, this is a, you know, a consistency between the UK and the US is that, you know, if a government raises tax, then they're going to go down in the polls when we should really view taxation as something which is a civic duty, especially of people like billionaires and oh, absolutely. higher income. We need progressive taxation and that's how we're going to pay for a UBI. And, you know, uh, when a UBI gets dished out, however much money it is a week or a month or whatever, most of that money will be called back through taxation from those who might not necessarily need it, but it's just the idea that a UBI is there. Um, and I think, you know, since uh, Thatcher and Reagan in the 80s, like this idea of raising tax and inflation has been just so like frowned upon uh, when we need to say to people, look, it, if you pay more tax, more people benefit. Um, so yeah, just like reforming the whole tax system um, yeah, is and so important. Uh, I was mentioning earlier how uh, Economics Explained released a video talking about how the billionaires and trillionaires now that we're having don't have any decent investment for their money. And the best investment really right now is in national equity to reduce such social violence that we're seeing because taxes have been so ridiculously low. Even in mm. America, there is no tax bracket to account for millionaires. They cut off after a hundred thousand. Two hundred and fifty thousand, I think. Yeah, that's still a quarter million. It's not even half a million a year. Two, because I think back when Bush was in office, he got rid of that top tax bracket over five hundred thousand a year. Hey, did you have a question? Yeah, I was curious. Do you guys have um, credit scores there? I don't know if you guys do. Do you know what I'm talking we, about? We have like credit checks if you want like to get yeah. more. 
stuff? Is that what you? Uh, yeah, I think yeah. that is. Do people um, use your credit report to decide whether you can have a job or whether you can stay in an apartment in a flat? Um, I don't think it's as discriminatory here. Mm -hmm. I, the issue is, it's hard because if you're someone like myself, I've luckily never been in debt. I've lived with my parents until this year. So because I've never been in debt and had to pay anything back, I have a really bad credit score. If I was in debt and was paying things back, I'd have a good credit score. So it's, even the credit score, how it works is just mad because you should be in debt to make yourself have a good credit score. Uh, so you can pay something back when actually if you had no debt, which means that you're doing quite well, doesn't make you have a yeah, good credit score. It's very, oh. it's very bass backwards. You should start with a good credit score when you enter into the adulthood you know system instead mm. of the bad credit that they give you because you have no credit history it's like since yeah. you have no this credit history follows, they assume you're just not going to pay your bills this, this follows our major macroeconomic theory that everyone has a right to debt and that that debt is what actually fuels uh, yeah. most of consumer spending and production that will hopefully create more wealth than the debt is worth in our inflationary economies. Yeah, it's bonkers to me. Well, uh, except, because... like, I can't get a loan to get anything. I have, I have atrocious credit score. I, it's just disgusting. But, like, because of that, you know, I, I only had, like, six or seven hundred dollars in debt that I it was medical and I decided not to pay it, apparently, you know, and, like, my, now my credit score is absolutely bad. Right. But I could not apply uh, for like a business loan. I can't apply for a car. I can't apply for a lot of things. Uh, and it becomes this discriminatory, uh, discriminatory thing because I can't even like without like an UBI or anything else, I can't be fully nomadic and survive and even try and start any monopoly if I, or you know empire if i so desired because i can't even get the loan to even like get a footing <laughs> into this world and like i'm sure everybody's credit is kind of like crashing right now right you know mm. like everybody like i have a friend she's like i just paid it off and now this happened and it's just like so stressful to her that it's causing her she literally her hair is falling out her hair is falling out okay that's how bad it is and um uh, like th that's what like the society and COVID is doing to people you know <laughs> it's not healthy man no it is not the credit uh the credit thing is um really strange because when you get older you have this other problem where you may have a lot of money you may have uh assets sitting in the bank now because you've been working your whole lifetime you've been saving you've been doing everything you were supposed to do but if you stop uh, if you go into retirement and you stop working and you ha don't have a stream of income from something, supposing you didn't buy real estate and you're not, you know, making rent and you're not, you no longer have a stream of income, even though you have money in the bank, your credit score also plummets because uh, you can, you have to always have a stream of income. If you don't have a stream of income, then you're seen as uncredit, your credit, not credit worthy. Even if you have the money in the bank, you could just pay it. In the yeah, but, uh, credit equation, it's your income per year versus your overall debt position. So that's the problem. And that ratio is what judges that. So when you so, do drop to zero income, it's horrifyingly magnified. So maybe with so that in mind. You can't even buy a house once you, even if you have them, unless you just buy it with cash because you have no credit. So you can't go and maybe. just, you know, get a loan. <laughs> Just an idea occurred to me, maybe with that in mind, a productive argument could be made to some of the wicked masters of the universe that, hey, all this poverty is making people debt averse. If we give everybody $2,000 a month, they'll be more comfortable taking out loans. They'll be more comfortable going into debt. Wouldn't you like that, you evil demon? I mean, like, yes, right? they've, they've <laughs> never heard of the old adage of a rising tide raises all ships. You're yeah. a billionaire now, but if you allow people to get an income of $2,000 per month as a universal basic income, then that means that in the United States, that's 300 million people having $2,000 extra to spend every month. How long before you become a trillionaire? 
Oh, no, that's like a handful of years we'd have a first cold, hard cash trillionaire. Exactly. This is actually more powerful than that because the reason I think that the masters of the universe, as you put it, have chosen not to implement a basic income of at least $4,000 because $4,000 a month is where people stop committing suicide in ass uh, is because of debt. If we started operating purely off of cash, there would be far less enforcement through the financial system and through the central bank system because people would actually be able to just straight up pay for shit instead of using a credit card or a loan or or collecting, uh, taking a collection. But then they can just raise the prices on, you know, homes and cars arbitrarily because they control what things cost. Problem well, what solved. I'm saying, what I'm saying is that there could actually be a massive deflationary spike in prices because everyone stops buying loans and stops using the major overvaluation that loans cause. For oh, example, I fully understand. I just know that these people are if they can't raise the prices on common goods because that stuff is based on supply and demand, then you know more lug they can call having a home a luxury and a car a luxury the same way that they do when you fill out your applications for uh, debt relief or any form of social safety net welfare programs. So I mean they can just. They own all of the banks. They own all of the ability for people to buy real estate. They can just raise the cost of real estate and cars, and they can make up for it there, and they probably will. What, what I'm so, saying is that central banks only have so much power over their loans. The realtors and the, the supply and demand of the markets are really what causes that. So if people suddenly don't need to take loans, they could negotiate prices down much easier. So one big problem that I know the UK is facing as well is that a lot of people who are very wealthy are putting their money somewhere. They have to put it somewhere where they think it's going to make them more money while they're doing, you know, right? And so what they do is they buy up all the real estate and they don't have enough people, like it's just, they're just one person, but they own all this real estate. And so all of that real estate can't be lived in. Uh, some of the best homes in the best locations in London are taken uh, because of that and then they just go to they just go to waste they kind of get the degraded same. because it's an investment and they don't need to yeah. keep it fixed up or anything not maintained and the, yeah we have you mean the Trump part. method the exact same uh, thing happened in uh, Rome and it's theorized as the first economic uh, bubble that we could call a recession in today's times the government forced everyone forced all the nobility to start taking a serious plurality of land as part of their portfolios yeah, we, um, we definitely have like a housing crisis in the UK where we're not building enough homes and we don't have enough homes and we also have a massive homelessness crisis that could be solved but is not being solved. In Covid everyone that was homeless was um, housed, not everyone but was, was given the opportunity to be housed and hotels opened up for homeless people but after Covid and now those people have just been thrown back onto the streets with nowhere to live and in all the major cities across the UK, <sighs> we have like sweeping gentrification where people are buying up the property, the house prices are going through the roof, the people that are actually from those areas can't live there anymore. And so they're being pushed out to worse housing for higher costs. And it's just basically taking any culture out of capital cities and putting in a bunch of uh, middle class rich people. But well, it's, I it's heard... that's happening everywhere. I had heard that way beyond what you're describing is that people from foreign countries are wanting to invest in London properties because they need to put their money somewhere where they think that the, the price of that property will continue to go up. So it's an investment like investing in fine art. You can, you know, have a painting that's worth thirty seven million dollars and they put it in. A, they put it on the wall and there it is. Thirty seven million dollars on the wall. Yeah, there's, um... they expect it to maybe go up in price because it's going to be only that one painting you know, for the next century, and somebody else will buy it for 50 million in a few years when there's even more money to go around. So, um, I, and I believe that there's been like Russians and uh, Arabs and Chinese people coming in and trying to buy those properties, uh, right in down, you know, like the city, like the best parts of the city. 
yeah like that happens definitely um there's like foreign investment but it doesn't really benefit um people of London that much because obviously like no one lives in them like you said but then there's many ways the uh, rich av avoid paying tax and one of them is obviously the, the Cayman Islands and so on but um we could I'm sure we could go on talking about that for a long time but um I'm afraid me and Liam will have to pop off now because we're gonna have dinner um but thank you so much for the opportunity to join and get your perspective because it's a a very similar but also a different perspective on a lot of yeah. issues Really would you, gosh, thank I you. would say the same to you. Thank you so much would for you coming. Would share and... your Twitter? Oh, yeah. Um, I have to actually check because, like Leo said, we're <laughs> very in there. I put, um, I saw a twitter.com slash UBI lab youth. Is that correct? Is that yours or is there another yeah, one? Yes, so that, that, that's, uh, yeah, that's UBI. That's ours. And then, um, my personal Twitter is Lydia underscore Gordon. And then we have UBI lab women. And our name is at UBI Lab Women, which is pretty straightforward. Thank you. Oh. I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, what was the UBI one? Uh, I think Faze just popped in the chat. Yeah. And then uh, my my personal Twitter, if you want, it, is uh, at uh, Leo Hones 1999 because that's the year of my birth. And Get I'm out of town. Um, yeah. So yeah, no. Thank you. For so inviting. you're one year oh. older than my two young people. <laughs> <laughs> my oldest son is was born in 2000. Oh, oh there we are. I th yeah. <laughs> thank so you so much for joining them. us. Can you yeah. come back? No, yeah, we'll <laughs> definitely come, come back. regulars. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, apologies, you have to go. It's, uh, it's a time difference. Absolutely. Yeah, no, thank you for giving us your time. The, I think the last time I put 99 in my email address it was because it was the year 1999. So, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, well, good night, you, good night, you or good morning. Or, what time, I don't know Hi. what time it is, but evening. yeah. <laughs> good evening Dinner to you time. both. Thank you again. Yeah, good time, yeah. Thank you so much. Guys. Very good meeting you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a beautiful dinner. Have a good evening, guys. All right. And well, what nice do you, suits. Do you guys want to continue or do you want to go ahead and uh, sign off now? I um, haven't talked to Faye in a while. <laughs> I, I I wanted to talk to this a little bit longer if that's cool with you sure, guys. Yeah. Does everyone uh, else well, you? did you want to go through the trending on uh, Twitter right now? Because Trump decided to uh, make another lovely, dumb statement about how he wants to cut all of the funding to university systems in the United States because of the mythical radical left indoctrination. Huh, man. And now I, it's trending. I am not as against that as you might think. <laughs> the I university think system is very bad. We have a very ossified, corrupt university system, and it is very intertwined with uh, our electoral politics problems where if you don't go to the right places, there's no way you get to the right, the certain offices. Don, I will tell you something more provocative that's closer, more closely aligned with what he probably means. Not exactly what he means, but. Um, They're not uh, paying him to go to Trump University? No, there, there is a sort of a virulent brand of neoliberalism that, that is indoctrinated into, into people at universities. Uh, and it's a very hot button issue because if you criticize it, people will say, well, you're just, you know, you're, you're a bigot in this way or that way, or it's, it, because it's all about intersectionality and that whole paradigm. And it's being, it was a paradigm designed to protect people with no power, but it was co-opted by people with power and it's being used to protect the status quo, being used to uh, conflate issues of class with, with other issues to prevent um, meaningful gains from happening on economic fronts. I mean, it, I, I keep trying to to say you guys have to watch to to uh, watch Professor Adolf Reed. On, uh, he just did a couple things on Jacobin that are really good about this. And he he's he supposed to in the chat. He is a he is a black man, and he was in the civil rights uh, movement in the 60s and 70s. And he's an old professor. And he is saying right now, anti-racism, institutional anti-racism is doing for the status quo, for the elites, for the powerful to maintain their position of power, what institutional racism used to. So there is a bit of that, 
I think, going I, through university. I've definitely seen that from uh, circles of academia in the UK as well as here in the US. But there's a deeper cynic cynicism that could be reached with this if Trump really fully intends to make univers universities no longer tax exempt. He would be literally taxing government cash from students. Well, I mean, I think if that makes the, I think the university system should implode upon itself and we should find a better way to educate ourselves and figure out who's credentialed. So good. That's me. <laughs> I'm an accelerationist. So let, let Trump hang himself, I say. Yeah, let, let Trump destroy himself with the other bad people, with nothing, with the other uh, crooks. I mean, like the, the other bad systems, the other bad organizations, there, the other the, mafias. You know? That's a great long term view, but short term, millions of students will not be able to buy food or pay for rent or get gas Let's in their cars. Give them a basic income, I say. Well, I'm all for it, but <laughs> still, right now, he could literally tax money out of students' hands. That's a good point. I don't want that to happen right now. I would like I would like the things I would like the problems in the university system to be corrected in other ways. But what is one to do? I mean, I'm still waiting for my student loan to be forgiven because it was through a predatory lender and a non-accredited for-profit school that said that it wasn't a an unaccredited for-profit school. So oh, I I have a feeling this that he's not going to let. Uh, graduates go at either with this. I'm imagining he could tax the interest before it goes to the principal. Oh, yeah, I fully feel that. But no, right now, actually, be right before this uh, started, I uh, grabbed the mail and got a paper form of the email I got last week about how Miss DeVos, the education secretary oh. is trying to make a settlement with those of us who have had our uh, defensive repayment just stuck on our desk. Because I filed mine in 2016 while Obama was still in office and it's been in the process of being looked at for four years now. Damn. And in that four years, the school I went to has gone bankrupt, along with a lot of other schools that are similar. So it looks should like we, Sheridan has to go. Yeah, should we should we go ahead and say goodbye since Sheridan is also taking off? Uh, I mean, I didn't get to what I wanted to talk to, but that's okay. Uh, okay, no, no, let's no. say goodbye to continue. Sheridan. Let me, just, let me just bounce out. Uh, thank uh, well, you, everyone. It was do the you want to share your Twitter? I am. I am. Okay. It was a very stimulating conversation. Thank you, everyone. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at J Saber Gamer, J S A B E R G A M E R. It was uh, great. Have a good day, all. Wash your hands. Stay safe. Yeah, it's always good to wear have a you damn today. mask. <laughs> yeah, wear a damn mask. <laughs> See you next time. Bye bye. See Stay you next safe. week. So the thing that I wanted to talk about was actually the show called The Colony. It was made back in 2014, or at least that's when it was uploaded to YouTube. It's on YouTube, so you can watch the whole first and I'm second. I'm trying to remember when it came out, because I remember that I was in college when it came out, so it was definitely before 2014. Okay, but but essentially it was this experiment they did uh, where it was post-apocalyptic, the setting was LA, and there was a massive pandemic. Oh, look, all this sounds really familiar, doesn't it? Okay, anyway, um, so... Um, but they. And there you are right now, right? In, I know. I'm, I'm literally at the, the location of the the colony. <laughs> it's a little like it messes with me a little bit, but that's fine. But there was more dead people and a, a lot less um, structure left, right? And so uh, these people had like sleep deprivation. They had to travel. You know, they had to, to scavenge for food. And like, you know, the the first uh, season was like all these like really smart people and they were trying to reestablish uh, society and so they had to like create power and they had to essentially they were inventing all these things and eventually it became like creature comforts you know but like they had to do a lot of work and nothing was automated right and it was the most exa like exhausting thing possible and then like their mental bandwidth kept dropping and dropping right and when they had these other threats they uh, you know just normal everyday people who you know could probably handle their shit well enough you know uh, end up like yelling and screaming and they're like the scarcity mindset was like hardcore right and uh and then i thought about like 
universal basic income in comparison to a situation like this. And it's impossible. So if we let our structure go, right, universal basic income is kaput. It doesn't necessarily help anybody, right? Because we don't have the automation to even free our hands up to do any of this. And, and, and for me, I feel like we shouldn't drop down to like that desperate of a situation but you know in some areas where maybe a tsunami happens or a tornado or whatever happens right like yeah you, you lose these resources and to recover becomes even more difficult right but if if like ownership of the building because they were in this warehouse right and then the owners uh, walk in with key and they're like uh you know it's no longer their you know place or it becomes this challenge and like anything you've invested goes away right like you could have spent all your money and had money in a safe but money's useless in an environment like this people need food they need water they need you know necessities and it's just like think about what kind of benefits we have just simply because we have the society built that we have now and why would we not optimize it so that everybody could be like a little more freed up and it goes to show that if you're not working as a team, you know, you're going to have internal struggle. You're going to be snappier. And especially if you're hungry, you know, and, and you're losing weight, you know, and like they got mad at someone, uh, the person who had the key, they came in and like took a 30 minute shower and it used up all the, the water that they had collected. Right. And so that like caused a huge rift and they got in a big fight with these people. Now in the beginning of the uh, season, like these people were, like head on their shoulders violence bad like communication good and as you watch the show progress you see like they had to do this for 10 weeks right they're falling apart within the first couple weeks you know and it, do you it's, think it's a really um do you think it was very realistic because uh people have disproven that uh people behave the like young young men would behave the way that uh lord of the flies you know wrote people to behave so do you believe that this uh this colony would really happen in our real lives right now it does it seem realistic i think if we were if we lost power if we lost communication uh, if we lost running water a lot of this i think would probably occur because that means we actually have to do the foraging for all this stuff, right? And we can't pay someone else to do it, right? Like, that's not even a thing we can do in a society like this. I think if these particular things were cut off, it would cause a lot of problems. Now, I'm staying in a tent for a week, and uh, I had to carry my water in. And it's hot, right? Like, I can't even, like, you couldn't even live in certain areas if the power went off, right? Because people live in deserts. It's just hot. And then, you know, you got to give yourself a bird bath, you know, if you want to be clean and you have to, you know, like, but I was lucky that the water was already filtered, right? They had to filter their own water even, but it's the other countries already to this point, you know, they already have all these struggles, but if I would actually say it the other way around that everybody had a way of living that was a traditional way of life that worked. And then we've destroyed those traditional waves of life and created this whole new society where everyone's independent on, uh, it's not independent, but actually interdependent on other people providing things that are absolutely crucial to their survival. So it's not just that we need somebody else to build the cars because we can't individually build a car. We can't even get water or food without other people now. And we don't even know how to build a shelter. Whereas this is why I've been saying that if uh, if I were trying to find someplace else to live during the this pandemic and then if there was a, became a, a pop apocalyptic type sort of situation for us, um, I would rather go to Mexico than to go to Canada because I sense that Canada is more similar to us. Uh, whereas in, in Mexico, there are vast areas where people just live a traditional life and don't need very much from trading. And I think that's ultimately what 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 uh, protects people is not participating in this new modern economy. Well, I would disagree with you on that. In some spots, um, mostly because, because even though there is a lot of technological improvements that are used for rural areas of the United States, there's still a large amount of us out here that 
know how to do some of the basic stuff. We know how to, you know, boil water because rural areas, sometimes the water will have issues and it's well water. So you got to boil the water. You got to, you know, deal with all that stuff. And then you've also usually got, got farm animals. So you've got food, you've got crops, you've got, you know, people who know how to make and build things. So, I mean, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be as comfortable as this is now, but there are some areas in rural, you know, America that might be, you know, habitable and weather a, an apocalyptic scenario a bit better. Yeah, I mean, I, I would that, definitely yeah. not want to be here yeah. in this part of Montana because of the water situation. It gets really dry. If it became a drought all of a sudden and we didn't have the technology to like be able to predict the weather and see that rain was coming you know water sources can dry up for days on end i mean i have gone over many creeks that are used as watering holes for livestock that are free ranging on large swaths of land like they will have a you know giant pond one day and then the next day it's all grass again because the water is either evaporated or gone into the ground because you know there's gonna be long stretches of dry periods so if i was going to go to a rural area i'd go back to my home state of minnesota because land of ten thousand lake what do we have fresh water i think water is one of well it is one of the basic necessities to life right and so like but it just blows my mind how little we are making sure this infrastructure is actually even safe. Like, I mean, I was talking about Flint earlier. There are people, in, like I met some people in LA one time, they were like talking about the metals in their blood. It was from the water they were drinking and they were very sick from just metals in their blood that shouldn't be there, right? And they like, I don't know exactly how they cleanse their blood, but they felt so much better when they were done, right? You know, and, and it's just like, we don't even like, take care of something so vital to our existence. And and even our sewage system, right? Like we aren't allowing people bathroom access in some places and, you know, uh, homeless people are sleeping where they're shit, you know, and it's not healthy. And uh, I think... You know, it, it might this not be working. Of, this kind of general, like everything not working all at once can only happen when all your incentives are not aligned properly. So, so much human endeavor has been going in the wrong direction. You know, like um, we've lost track of the ability to, to focus on where value actually comes from because we keep talking about money, 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 money. But the, the money has no value in and of itself. The only thing that determines value is how much humans need it. So the, the basic human needs are, should be the most ex, should be of the most valuable, and yet they shouldn't also be mo the most expensive. So that doesn't make any sense. Like the thing we need most is clean air, because if you don't breathe for a moment, you're, you're you know you will die. Then we need clean water. But and yet these are the things that should be the cheapest. Right. I mean, nobody should have to pay for clean air or or pay for uh, clean water. So it's our our incentives being not aligned properly is really uh, it's it's killer. It kills every single day without us having with any without anybody saying, oh, I did violence today. But and yet it's the most violent thing we could be doing to our population. It's not like I mean, it's it's you know, we think it, it seems unthinkable a future where you pay for like clean air for like pristine bottled air or something. But man. It could happen. I could see, you know, you go to the convenience store, you get a tank of fancy good air, you put in your air filter so you can have like you can breathe good for four hours. Like that could be America. Yeah. That, that's a very American. That way is actually an American that. way thing. Totally. Why American. are we this way? I don't space know. Balls. It's so hard not to despair. Yeah, space balls or yeah. Didn't the Super Mario movie also do that? Yeah. Yeah, right? So, you know, it's like it's like it's like Faye Doni was saying. You know, shows, movies, prepare us for the future, right? So get ready for buying air, branded air. Or, or we use those movies as a point of aversion where we're like, nah, I'm good. Maybe I will Jack Mad that. Max. We will not be Mad Max, but... I mean, we're already an idiocracy, so... That's the Canadian way. That's what Canadians do. They're like, I don't want to be an American movie. I'm going to give health care to people. And now they're no, going to have a UBS. No, Canadians do have an aversion to our Hollywood movies. You're right. <laughs> and rightfully so. Right. So they learn from the movies and then they 
create action plans for change so they don't like fall into those right so we would right. have organizations like friends of trees that plant trees okay oh imagine that like I, and like algae is actually really good for oxygen too or something i don't remember it's but also like, good I'm, as a biofuel and if you're using the right algae you can actually create electricity oh okay i didn't know that oh right, we just but, need more swamps huh <laughs> but but that's the thing just though. the the right kind of swamp not the kind right, I'm that tired of trying to drain all our natural swamps all right we need Joe them. biden's gonna come on and be like we're all gonna breathe a little less just a little everybody's gonna breathe less equally <laughs> but now we have concrete jungles right so we're not actually uh living in a, symb a symbiotic relation to earth really we're not like the water that does come from the sky can't get absorbed on a concrete covered land right uh, and then like we're talking about housing and stuff like that and like honestly I bet you we have enough housing. There's just enough people with a second house that aren't letting somebody live there or hotels. Like, but like, even oh, hotels, no, the okay. numbers are there on that. We have like three vacant homes or apartments for every homeless person. I in heard the six. United States. Six now? <laughs> I heard you know, six. Yeah, there's a lot. It's, it's at between three and six, we'll call it. Okay. So it is an absolute tragic embarrassment either way. And a, a demarker that society has been broken for a long time. And it's oh, yeah. severely broken. Speaking oh, about homelessness, I will uh, bring up a lovely thing that my wife and I discussed this morning, considering the fact that our representatives have taken a two week vacation to not vote on new stimulus or extending the unemployment benefits. And people haven't been paying their rent since March in a lot of cities. Apparently, a third of New York residents. Uh, in New York City and all the boroughs do not have the ability to pay the rent, but because of one the way third. that our system, yeah, one third. The way our wow. system works, though, is that uh, when those uh, landlords start collecting, and some of them already have, or at least have started filing eviction notices during the pandemic because people haven't been able to pay, we're going to have millions upon millions of people out on the street in the very for a period of time and the last time that something like that happened what 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 happened at the beginning of the great depression when people lost their homes people made tent cities on the lawn of the white house so that's going to happen again we're going to go from hoovervilles to trump this is why, yeah. square circle. in a couple Before of weeks we get too far off this let's let's see let's try to remember you and me this moment and see if in three months uh academia has not spun this as a non class issue as like they're out on the street because of some other facet of intersectionality than money because they will do anything to make it about not money let's see i hope i'm wrong but if i'm right let's it's make a note documented. <laughs> hey i feel you on that upset. too but i i i feel you on the that they're going to find a way to make it not about money but it is so about money no listen this was a I want see. I can't make jokes about it because it's a sensitive topic, and we are living in like a very Victorian kind of time, like an Inquisition of sorts. So I'm going to just say that. Yes, Fay. Capitalism is just as you much can. of a fail, especially <laughs> so right I'm, now. Well, I mean, look, I, I get, okay, here, I get very joke, uh, joke I can't make. I'll, make. I'll make it like I'll make it. Just, I'll, I, I'll make the framework. It's like okay. And they're going to say they're not out on the street because they couldn't pay the rent. They're out on the street because of uh, disadvantage X, you know, and I don't want to pick on a particular disadvantaged group, but they'll be like, no, the people in this fucking block disadvantage X, nothing to do with the economy. Uh, we shouldn't be so bigoted against disadvantage X. And that's how they're going to try to spin it. And that's the poison that they're going to try to shoot through us on the left. So we got to watch out for that gaslighting. All right. It's not the corporation's fault. It's it's somehow the people's fault because they are of this group. Yes. Um, no, 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 I get... no, 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 no. It's the system for discriminating against this group, but it's not. Oh, the system is no. discriminating so against. So, like, uh... so they have half their rights. It's like, oh, it's not their fault. It's not individual responsibility. It's systemic responsibility, but not because of money. It's because of their, you know, uh, disability, ethnicity, culture, religion, sexuality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anything but money. It'll be like, it's not their fault that they're on the street. They were evicted because of 
their intersectionality X, you know? So how do we avoid them doing this? Nothing. Shame. We just got to listen to them be like, okay, you are distracting us because you want to preserve the status quo because you want to preserve your power because you're connected to big money. Well, <laughs> and also, about that, we're discriminating there's... against people who don't have money. How about just that? <laughs> There, there's a thing that's supposed to happen tomorrow. I don't know if I'm going to be able to participate because I don't know where my representative lives. But there has been, through the Yang Gang, a uh, proposal, because our representatives have gone on vacation, to occupy their lawns, to go to their houses and protest at their houses, at their places of business, because they are failing us. They are not doing their job. You're talking I, about Congress people? The yeah, homes of Congress people? The people's oh. stimulus. To petition for a people's stimulus. I think we need a justice to come onto our show and talk to some people. We'll get we'll get Scott Santons to talk to a justice of the US and then we'll also maybe uh, I think we need cuz if you think about it we're kind of lobbyists but we're not, right? We're not technically. Uh, we're, we're lobbyists without the large sum of money. Yeah, we don't. Yeah. We don't have any money for for lobbying in that sense. But but see, that's the problem. Yeah, right, right. Okay, so that's what this show is about, right? We we have the opportunity to lobby people without actually having to go through some of the process. But really, it's just discussions. We're we're a think tank, right? And we're like, hey, by the way, did you know these are some uh, parts of the uh, formula you haven't even considered have you heard of this thing you know and just like plant seeds like it, it could be all them who come to the conclusion but like you know just the thing is we are not reaching high enough I think I think we need to almost just like get people as high as we can I mean of course we're trying we're trying of course uh but like I mean yeah. it would totally feed need, the ego know, of a lot of people happen to uh, try and have them on our podcast, be like, hey, uh, Senator X, you're trying to get reelected. How's about you come on this uh, podcast and try and tell us why our views are terrible and you need to be reelected? Hey, uh, uh, Donald he's, Trump. She's talking about justices, which are, um, you're talking about a different, a different aspect of the government if you have three aspects yeah i'm i'm actually thinking uh earlier today when we were discussing before we got on the podcast i was thinking it would be great if we could replace all of our politicians with uh, algorithms and bots <laughs> yeah that was the discussion we were having in the in the twitter uh dms yes and that's a great idea because guess what robots can't get you to emotionally you know, connect with an issue the same way that a person can with the inflection of their voice and their <laughs> attempts at, you know, evoking emotions with the way that they present their views. Can I also add something? Their stomach doesn't get to play a point in it. Okay, there are actual studies that judges who are hungry will be more like hammer down uh, than after they eat lunch, right? They're actually quite nice after they eat food. So if we have judges that like their mood is dependent also on how hungry they are, uh, we have a broken system, right? The, 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 like that should not have any effect, but it does. Like, uh, I mean, it's been a while since I've looked at the study, but like, yeah, uh, like if you have judges, okay, that are affected by food, Imagine what you got politicians <laughs> affected by. Okay, like you know, it's just. Uh, well, that's why there was some. Who was it that um, uh, one of the comedians had suggested that uh, what we need to do is slip a little bit of weed. <laughs> <into the players. laughs> um, was that food and drink, uh, and then was that Cheech uh, Marin, Tommy <laughs> Chong? I'm trying to think of all the pro weed ones. David Chappelle. Uh, plenty of them. I'm sure might be more than one of them have suggested this, but I, I actually think it might be a good idea to do some. I'm pretty know, like, sure. I'm pretty sure that before uh, you go in there and start talking about something. I'm pretty sure Carlin suggested LSD back in the 70s, uh, but. <laughs> Well, was it Angela? Angela was saying like Trump was acting like he was on acid. It's like no, that's that's really you don't know what people on acid act like. You can't I'm, be an egomaniac on an ego suppressant. So Angela was like, okay, that's a fair point, you know. Let's. <laughs> so 
so I actually want to talk about this theory I have. Okay. A little tiny uh, bit. I'm sorry. <laughs> So the uh, connection between narcissism and the reticular activating system that I brought up a few times. Now, if you haven't heard of me talk about it, it's, uh, it's essentially the part of the brain that finds evidence for whatever you believe, right? Now, I'm a genius. I'll find evidence. I'm an idiot. I'll find evidence, right? It's, it's non-biased, right? But narcissists believe their lies, okay? And so if they believe their lies, then the reticular activating system is only going to double down for them, right? So think about Trump, who believes what he says, right? And he's learned this formula of how to sidestep things and like, you know, get his agenda across, right? But if he honestly believes that he is doing such a good job uh, and doesn't hear the criticisms because he doesn't believe they're even true, then using the reticular activating system, it's making him more of a narcissist to the rest of us, right? The comparison to lying and dodging and living in essentially an alternate reality i think it's very possible because of that and i think we should have brain scans honestly we should have brain scans of any politician because you can actually see psychological disorders with uh just brain scans right uh, there there's a lot of consistency uh and then you like but why don't we do these kind of things i don't know like there's a lot of science behind it and and like well, our system um, allows them to be very successful this this is a very successful narcissist so if narcissism is helping you to succeed in our system how you know that's that's a problem that we have to we i don't know how do we fix that one well see the thing is is that narcissism and a lack of empathy and being a sociopath is basically the three things that you need to succeed in capitalism and capitalism helps you succeed in getting elected to government in our country which is why there are so many people in governance that have zero empathy or sympathy or care about their constituents because it's easy to be successful if you're a narcissist that's that's what got them there that's the, the terrible truth of it and, you know, I seem like a ridiculous cynic sometimes, but the reason I look to accelerationism to, to solve our problems is because if the people at the helm are the problem, we have a who watches the watchman scenario. They're not going to change the rules that enable them to keep abusing us and abusing the rules and exploiting us. So but I feel Twitter like the only watch. way this, that we're going to get anything done is probably disruptive protests i don't know i don't i mean some if things go with the trump vills and people by the millions in dc and new york are homeless and on the streets and start taking up residence in front of their state county national government offices because they have nowhere else to go well that's gonna be disruptionist and so, yeah. the the powers that be are going to try and arrest arrest and uh, attack and antagonize these people. And we're gonna have mass murders, uh, mass genocide of homeless people. But because of all of the, uh, you know, social media we have, it's gonna be broadcast live to the world. The, the broadcasting to the world is the only thing that's, I think, gonna change what's happening. And the fact that everyone's using their cameras. Yeah, yeah but uh, yeah. we need to wrap up, right? Yeah. yeah it's too, it's come up on two o'clock so uh it's great talking with you guys um but yeah uh my name is shale my twitter is at s-h-a-e-l-r-i-l-e-y um who hasn't said their twitter yet they oh, i'm i'm at uh palestine math and uh thank you for for coming to the discussion today um i love the group that we had today thank you so much yeah that was a good group um faye Doni. Hi, yes, my uh, Twitter handle is at Tisdoni, uh, that's T-I-S-D-O-N-E-Y. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone, by the way, this is a good talk. <laughs> yeah, it's very nice. This was did very you, good. Tisdon, mm -hmm. did you, did you want to put your um, Twitter for everyone? Yeah, I guess I better. Um, you may know me better as Dizdon, aka Dizdon Plays. That's at D-I-S-D-O-N-N-P-L-A-Y-S. I'm also on Twitter and you, or bleh, YouTube and Twitch under the same username. There we go.
Thank oh. you. And and Jeremy? Should we? I know. I wanted to say hi to Jeremy too. He was so <laughs> quiet today. Yeah, I'm just Jeremy's been. Jeremy's been doing the behind the scenes Twitch streaming. Yeah, uh, yes, they have been uh, pretty quiet this episode, but it's been a great conversation, guys. Uh, if you guys would like to follow me on Twitter, you can follow me at Jeremy Sammons One. That is J E R E M Y S A M M O N S and the number one. All right. Well, goodbye, everybody. We'll see you again soon. Thank Take you. care. Stay safe. Bye. Take care of each yep. other. Stay Bye. safe. Take care. Wear a damn mask. <laughs> <laughs>